uh, we have a special for you on this tape and for the folks that are sitting here. We're going to talk about uh, something that uh, is known to many, spiritualism in the Jewish tradition of Kabbalah. Kabbalah. But what we're going to talk about tonight is Kabbalah magic. Okay. Kabbalah magic. The practical Kabbalah of what, you know, that word is a, defined as a magical system. Isn't that interesting? A magical system based on esoteric doctrines of the Jews. Esoteric means within. Okay, within. And so I I you'll see a word here that's interesting for Christmas time, which is magi. And of course, that's where the word came from. Magic, magi, astrology is, is, it was their forte. So we look at esoteric, that which is within spirit, magic, Kabbalah. What they referred to in those days as, as magic was the things that we refer to as manifestations of the spirit. To them, it's magic. We'll define, uh, of course, uh, this, is the, this is the doctrine of the Jews, spiritual Jews. We'll define that later, but to understand, of course, that a Jew is one who dwells at the right side. Let's let that go for now. We won't get into that. A Jew is one who dwells on the right side. So when, they, when we talk about Kabbalah magic being the esoteric doctrine of the Jews, let's then define that word for ourselves so we can see if we can fit into this. Go on to page 920 in Little Bibles. In Romans chapter 2, page 920, Romans chapter 2, and let's take a look here and see if we can define uh, a Jew, the word Jew. Basically, if I was to say to you, what is a Jew, or you say somebody who lives up in New York and talks like this, and I don't know, my name is Isidore, what's this, I don't forgot that, that's a Jew. No, it has nothing to do with that. That's a, that's a, that's a, a religious base of a group of people who, who live in the Middle East, but that's not what this is talking about. We're talking about Kabbalah magic, which is the esoteric or inner doctrine of the Jews. And what I want you to see is, do you qualify? So let's open the Bible to page 920. You have your little Bibles there. Open it to page 920. And look at Romans chapter 2. And go to verse 29, for, uh, verse 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Now that's interesting and that's very, very important. Here's a statement by one of the prime Bible writers, Paul. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Now that's important. Now that takes the whole thing and changes it. See? God's chosen people is not a race of people who lives in a particular portion of the planet Earth. God's chosen people are those who dwell inwardly at the right side, the Jew. And so then Kabbalah magic talks about that which is within who? You and me. That's Kabbalah magic. The intellectual uh, or, or the uh, intricate um, rituals of the Kabbalists connected with something called Laws of Correspondence and the Tree of Life. And that's the entire aspect of Kabbalah, okay? Let's just take that off there, and we'll talk about the Laws of Correspondence and the uh, Tree of Life. That's Kabbalah magic. Kabbalah is extremely complex, very, very complicated. Very, very difficult to understand. And right here, we're only going to skim the surface so you get an idea, just so that you can walk out of here and say, well, I know that you know, this exists. I have, a, I have a, an, a basic idea what these people were into. Okay? The Kabbalah set out to familiarize themselves with the paths of the tree of life. And remember, this is an inner tree. Albert can tell you that the human body, actually, if you were to take and diagram, it looks like a tree. It, it, the trunk and then... The branches spread out all over. looks like a tree. And that's basically what the tree of life is. The tree of life is you. The tree of life is me. But what they did, they got themselves involved in trying to trace this tree of life 
from an outward standpoint, and so they got involved with the divine and angelic names of invocation through prayers and chanting and, and incantation. All of these types of things were very, very ritualistic, very spooky. See, that's what this was. This was the Kabbalah magic was built around chanting and invocations and all kinds of things. Many of, of, of you may not have too much uh, understanding of this, but what you see as a, kind of an evil thing springs out of the ancient Kabbalah, which was the, oh gosh, I hope I can, the five-pointed star. Not too good looking, but anyhow. But then each point connected. They call it pentagram. Pentagram. And, and, and that was in, they would invoke the power of the pentagram and they would banish the power of the pentagram, the five pointed star. And it was used as a magical symbol. And it, it, it emanates, all this stuff emanates out of Kabbalah. Very, very spiritual, very, very magical. See? And, 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 and quite interesting because it was part of the Jewish religion. If you go into Lakewood or some of these other places, you, you, you'd start mentioning Kabbalah in front of these people. They're gone. Just like if you start mentioning the kingdom within the right hemisphere of the brain to Christians, they're gone. And they want no part of this stuff. It's spooky. There was an ancient magic group, and I would name this for you. They studied very strongly, the uh, Kabbalists did. They were called the Hermetic Order. Do you see something here in that one? Do you see the word hermit? Do you see where, where things come from? Those who stayed alone, those who stayed in the caves, those who experienced this loneliness and, and darkness. It's the root of that word. Well, that was the Hermetic Order. And the, um, uh, they, there was a part of the Hermetic Order known as the Order of the Golden Dawn. And, and, and the Kabbalists used to be deeply involved in studying from that ancient order, the Order of the Golden Dawn of the Hermetic Order. That word hermit comes out of, uh, uh, out of the uh, word hermetic. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of this. The oldest piece of material to ever show writing of any kind is known as the Rosetta Stone. Kathy may be interested in that, being a, uh, interested in stones. And things. The Rosetta Stone is the most ancient document in the world. There was writing on this stone. It's the, o it's the oldest piece of writing in ever, ex ever found in, in the world, this stone. And actually on this stone is the writing of Hermes, H-E-R-M-E-S, Hermes. And in that, on that stone, Hermes is called the great and the great. The great and the great. And now this is an important part. He is, on the Rosetta Stone, defined as the divine intelligence of the higher mind. Isn't that interesting? I'm telling you that the very first writing that people ever found speaks of Hermes as the great and the great and the divine intelligence of the higher mind. That's the first thing that ever, ever was ever seen that was written. This is interesting. This very, what they used to do in Greece, you'd go traveling off these roads and there would be these little shrines and they were places where people would stop and worship Hermes and the Hermetic Order. Now, you, they're exactly in the same place, but they've been replaced by Christian shrines. But actually, the shrines originally in those spots were of the saintly people who followed in the order of Hermes. Now they're, you know, you get St. Lucy and St. Beatrice and St. Barbara and St. Charlie and all these stuff, but it's the same stuff, exactly in the same spot. They've just changed the names, but same thing. Now, this is basically what Kabbalah was involved in, studying this ancient order, studying the strangeness of this hermetic order 
the, the hermit type of personality, the hermit type of religion, if you would, and, and these things of Hermes and the higher mind. But the problem was there was a very serious problem with Kabbalah. There was a very serious problem with Kabbalists, and there was a very distinct reason why it didn't work. The reason was that the Kabbalist groups tried to bring down power for worldly reasons. That's what they were into it for. They, they really were not concerned with a spiritual path. They wanted to get something out of it. They, they wanted to see some. In other words, they were going to raise the roof with some kind of a ritualistic thing until they saw something happen. You know, like uh, basically you see in a lot of in religious or Christian groups today, it's the same thing. You can, see that, you can see the people on TV, they can get very, very emotional. They want to see something. You know, a guy will pick somebody's uh, crutches up and throw them on the floor and make the guy get up and run up and down. And so. There's no spirit involved in here at all. There is bringing power down to make some kind of a physical demonstration. And most of the time, according to the history of the Kabbalah, these Kabbalists would fail. They couldn't do it. It wouldn't work. And as, to, as today, Christianity fails. And, and, you know, see, if they can't bring the power down and cause something to happen or change your life around, if you continue in poverty or if you continue in ill health, well, they don't say it's not the power. The power came down. You didn't accept it. Or you didn't have enough faith. Or the devil. The devil did it, not, not us, see. It's all the same stuff. I mean, of all the healings, I mean, that you've seen on television for everyone that's reported in some kind of a religious healing, you can find the same kind of miraculous healings out of hospitals of people that have no knowledge of God whatsoever. And, and, and you know, you hear a lot of people say, well, I've even, I've seen people on television say, well, we were in a crusade and this lady came down and she didn't have an eye and all of a sudden an eye formed in her head and all of this kind of stuff. Show me the doctor report. I don't want to hear that such kind of trash. But this is what Kabbalah failed at. This is what religion fails at, trying to produce a flesh and blood type of thing out of spirit, instead of melting in and becoming one with spirit as we've been instructed to do. Now, occasionally, occasionally something would happen, as it does in, in, in religion today. But more often than not, what occurred was that since the person was not following a spiritual path, but they were energizing this divine energy, the energy would follow through the lower channels and it would produce problems for the person. The person would wind up with all kinds of problems because the energy that they were turning loose within themselves, the electrical energy, was actually flowing downward and all kinds of things could happen. It's, it's just like they, they talked about, we talked about when people are deprived of sleep or something like that, they can become neurotic and have all kinds, not when they're deprived of sleep, but then when they're deprived of dreams. They can become neurotic and have all kinds of difficulties. So this is what, what happened with the Kabbalists is what happens with many in religion today. Instead of just functioning in the spirit realm and letting spirit do it, they tried to force it and had difficult things occur. Because basically what we learn out of this is never ever should you try to appropriate spirit selfishly for producing physical things for yourself. Because you, you, you can get yourself in such a state that you're liable to produce something in your body that is not positive, that is negative. I, I remember going into a church, a Christian church, and see, seeing something on the door. It says, come expecting a miracle. They always had that on the door. Come expecting a miracle. That's dangerous. Because what you're saying is we're going to create some kind of an emotional thing here until we make something happen. If it doesn't happen, we'll make it happen. And so it's, it's, it's no longer a flow of spirit, it's a flow of, of emotionalism. Jesus was aware of this. Jesus was aware of Kabbalistic magic, and he would say the same thing of charismatic magic, as he said of Kabbalistic magic. And he said it on page 786 of your Bible, which is Matthew chapter 11. So, so we look at, here, here, here what you had is people who were on track with the truth. They really were on the right path, but they misappropriated it and it failed. Okay. And, and in the same way, many in the, in, in, the, in the Christian realms today, they're on the right path, there's no doubt about it. There is a Holy Spirit. There is a power of a Holy Spirit. But when you misappropriate it physically and emotionally, you get trouble. 
Look at Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. So they're forcing themselves into a spiritual realm and trying to make something happen. Did you, ever see, did you ever see these things that they have down in Haiti, like these voodoo types of things? People get worked up into a frenzy. They're waving chickens around and all this kind of stuff. Until something happens, and it will. <laughs> you can make it happen. You can spend a lot of less time with chickens and just, you know, hit something in the veins or just smoke something or whatever. You can make things happen. There is no doubt about it. You can make things happen in a ritual because your emotions, the adrenaline gets flowing, you get into all kinds of wild things, the beat of the music and all of this stuff, and you're off to the races, and you'll, you'll see things happen, wild things that happen. But it's all happening out of the emotions and the adrenaline and all of these strange things that occur when the mind is, is revved up. That's taking it by force, and that's wrong. That's wrong. And, and that's where the Kabbalists got in, in trouble. That's where charismatics got in trouble. You can go into many charismatic churches and think you're into a Rolling Stones concert. It's the same thing jumping up and down, jumping and swinging and shouting and carrying on, but you go to a Rolling Stones concert, it's the same thing. In fact, you go to a Rolling Stones concert, you see all the people waving their hands, they got their hands up in the air, they're jumping up and down. And I'm not knocking a Rolling Stones concert, I'm not knocking out, I'm just trying to tell you what's the right thing to do, what is really true here, what's, what's right and what's not right. Is truth be dancing? It's, it, well, it, he said it's Sufi dancing. I think anything that tries, it, it depends. No dancing is wrong. If you dance trying to manifest something into the physical realm from the spiritual realm, it's wrong. But you can't do that. The spirit has to manifest itself. For instance, if you, if you, if I can tell you one thing. I, I know that the dance of the whirling dervish is right because there is no attempt. It's, it's just a meditation. It just spins and spins and spins so they can spin themselves into oblivion. But nothing, you know, that's when they're done spinning, they go home. But it's not trying, see, in many of these situations, what the Kabbalists are into, what the Charismatics get into, is they try to demonstrate. They're trying, see, it's like a lot of the evangelists on television. They can't get people to believe in God unless they show some kind of a demonstration. And Jesus was, a, was, was very outspoken against that. Very outspoken against that. They said, show us the signs. The only sign you're going to see is Jonah. You're not going to see anything. But people are not ready to believe in a spiritual realm, they have to see something physically. Because you've got to remember Luke 17, 21. The kingdom is within you, Jesus said. And if the kingdom is within you, then the change has to happen inside. And then the manifestation in your life has to come because you're doing it. You have to look at your life. You have to look at the events of your life and say, since you've been doing this, is there a change? Is it a positive change? And that, you, you have to decide. That's, it's, perf it's, it's your total personal thing. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with this church. It, ha it has to do with you. You are doing it. What were you doing before? What were the results in your life? What are you doing now? What are the results in your life? It's up to you. And, and, and basically, it's that simple. Buddha said there are four things, three things, remember. One, you've got to have a document. Well, you've got a document. You've got a Bible. Two, you've got to understand it. Most people don't because the Bible is an esoteric book. It's a spiritual, mystical book. I don't understand. I cannot for the life of me understand how people can, in, in spiritual or religious circles, talk about a Bible and then read it literally. Geography books you read literally. History books you read literally. Novels you read literally. literally. <laughs> Bibles you don't read literally. Bibles are mystical books. You can't read them literally. You have to read it spiritually. Okay? And when then you know, you, first you've got to document the Bible. Second, you understand it mystically, spiritually. Now, Buddha says there's one more thing. Do what it says. Try it. If it doesn't work, it's a fraud. And many have gone through years and struggles of religion and tried all of these things and it found it did not work because it's a fraud. You were defrauded. You parted with great sums of money. You parted with great sums of time. You parted with the 
your own in values to become one of the mob. You gave up your, your individuality, you gave up your, your, your beliefs in yourself in order to, to throw all of that away and become like one of the gang in this group. You had to believe like the group believed. And you were loved as long as you stayed with the group. Once you got away from the group, <laughs> to you. That's the way it was. So, you know. Those are the types of things that have to tell you, as Buddha says, it's a fraud. It's a fraud. See, what, what, what a lot of religious people try to do, and charismatics try to do, Kabbalists try to do, was to evoke a physical manifest, manifestation of power without realizing the power is in the mind and must be channeled by the spirit. Don't realize that. So what they do, you take, a, you take the physical mind and try to produce the power. Forget the spirit. Not realizing at all you know, that you've got to dwell inside and the manifestation will come from spirit, not from you exercising your emotions. Because what happens when you try this way or the charismatic way, it's like a big tank. And the tank you think is empty. But you've got to be sure. It's a gas tank. So in order to make sure, you want to see. So you light a match. <laughs> Bang. And that's basically what this is. You're taking something that is extremely powerful, you don't know what it means, you don't know how to operate within it, and you're fooling with it. It's the same thing here, and it goes right back to the point where God says in Isaiah 5, I believe it is, I create good and I create evil. One of the things that I found in talking with Christian people, they don't believe that's in the Bible. But it is. It is. God says, I create evil. Well, you say, how could God create evil? Very easy. God creates electricity, right? I mean, who made it? God, for lack of a better name. You want to see that stuff be evil? Let me come over and wire your house and see how fast your house burns to the ground. And maybe you'll be in it. That's evil. You want to see how good it is? Get a professional electrician to wire your house. And you'll have all kinds of appliances and lights going on and music playing and TV playing. But that same power in the wrong hands is evil. Atomic energy. Magnificent in the right hands. Lights up towns all over the world. Put it in the wrong hands. You saw what happened dropping on top of people. I mean, you know, God bless America. But they still dropped that thing on top of a lot of innocent babies and kids. They didn't, and killed millions of them. That's evil. Okay, so you have the same power. It depends how the power is used. That's why it's important for you to have teaching. You can use the power, and you don't know what you're doing, and you can hurt yourself. That's how you can hurt yourself with this type. That's what the Kabbalists did. That's what charismatics do. You said, I don't understand how to use the power. Very, very bad. Very, very bad. So how can you practice, I was going to say, safe sex, safe Kabbalah? <laughs> Same thing, basically. <laughs> ah, the art of using supernatural power safely. And what's the answer? The answer to using safe Kabbalah, safe spirit, you must get down to basics. You've got to get down to basics, or you're going to mess with this stuff and you're going to get hurt. Okay. The basics in Kabbalah is Torah, and Torah means law. You've got to follow the law. There is a law. It just, it just doesn't make any difference what you think. There is a law. The, the stars turn and the planets turn and the earth turns and everything goes in a precise way and you could either flow with it or buck it. But you've got to follow that if you're going to have the results here that you want for your life and you want for your family. To attempt to get spiritual and meditate and, and have all of this without the law is like a child trying to uh, solve a difficult equation without ha knowing how to add or subtract. How can you do that? That's where we get in so much trouble with religion. That's why so many religious teachers put people in fear and guilt and all of these things. 
because they are practicing something without truly understanding the basics of it, the law of it, and, and, and one person is passing it on to another person, and you've got years of inherited guilt and fear coming out of religion. Nobody knows really what the basis of it is. Emotionalism has no part whatsoever in it. Emotionalism has no part. How is the Bible specifically say that. Let's look at page 942. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, page 942. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's look at verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot manifest this. You can't do anything about it. You, can, you cannot do anything to make yourself spiritual. Spirit has to come to you. You can only make yourself available. If you make yourself available, it will come. But you can't, you can't get it to, to work in your body on your conditions. It won't work like that. So the important thing to understanding Kabbalah is understanding Torah understanding the law, understanding how this works. That's why it is so important that you listen. And that is why it's so important that you read. And that's why, and, and the basics are given to you so that you can appropriate them spiritually. This is what Jesus meant on page 881 when he said in John chapter 15. Page 881, okay? John chapter 15. What did Jesus say? Jesus didn't say, hey, wait a minute, I've made you clean by the power of my spirit. He didn't say that. Jesus didn't say, I've made you clean by, uh, by the power of the Almighty which falls down from heaven. What did he say? John chapter 15 and verse 3. You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. I have taught you the basics of how this works. So you will know how to appropriate it and how to touch it. And you touch it through the pineal of the single eye that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 6. So you've got to understand. You've got to understand the teachings or you cannot know how to appropriate the power. See, a lot of people just want to sit on the floor and go home and have it come. But then you're not going to know when it come or when it didn't come. You're not going to know... You're not going to know what you're supposed to do, how, what happens, or, or how you do it. You don't know. You just sit there, and you have this power, and it fly. it's just like you know, getting a car with eight cylinders and overdrive, and uh, you know, it has uh, all of this kind, and not knowing how to work it. All you know is I, I put it in gear, and I say, oh, I didn't know it had overdrive. I didn't know it had a rear defroster. I didn't know that it had power. I didn't know any of this stuff. Because you never read, you never, you never listened to the one who made it explain to you how this works. This is a tremendous power. And, you know, it's very easy for you, and most people do it. And I get letters from people every day. I'm so stacked up with letters of people who say, have you ever read the, the course in this? Or have you ever read Joe Blow's study on this? Or have you ever read? And I just like to say, have you ever read Jesus Christ and what he said? Why? I mean, the people that are writing to tell you to read these various books, they got this from someplace. Why go to them? Why not go right to the source? This is the source of it. I mean, you can go into these bookstores, there's billions of books. But there is one source. The umbilical cord from heaven is through Krishna, Buddha, and Jesus Christ. So the emphasis that many in Kabbalistic magic have put is many in, 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 in charismatic circles, and that is uh, ceremonial magic with all of its vestments and colors and all of this stuff. And you see it, you see it today in many of the churches, the rituals of the, uh, of the incense and the... And the and the colored vestments, it's all very beautiful, and it all, has a, it all has something to say. Ritual is very, very important in Kabbalah magic. And every prayer and every invocation and every movement is done in a, separate, in a special way. You see it now today in the Catholic Church. You know, they take the book off of here, and they put it over here. You say, well, and then the guy will come and take the book off of here, and he'll put it over here. He says, what is he taking? Why does he leave it? I don't know what this is all about. But there's a reason. There's a reason. But nobody tells anybody the reason. See, all I know is the guy takes the book from here, puts it over here, reads something here, takes up the book, brings it over here. What's the matter with here? Why is it? Have to? 
But there's a reason. Why does the guy that the smoke, what is this with the water splinking and all of this stuff? All of these things, beautiful. But that should be the last part of it. It's no good unless, first of all, you understand what's being done. What's the purpose of it? What's the reason for all of this? You got to understand something. In, in Exodus 25 to 27, don't go there. God gives detailed instructions to Moses on the making of candlesticks and vestments and oil and incense. It's got to be this, it's got to be that, it's got to be the other thing. So ritual is basically God-given. It's called mitzvah. It's a command. Mitzvah. That's a command. But why? Because its only purpose is that you begin to understand. First you understand the purpose, then you can act it out in this way to put it into your physical mind to embrace the teachings with your whole being, see? But before you ever get involved in any kind of a ritual, you should understand. How many, I bet you all of you, I know I have, dunked in water and got baptized. You didn't know what the heck it was doing. You didn't know what I mean. You were convinced that that water, it could have been polluted, but you were convinced that there is a God somewhere that is not going to let you off the hook unless somebody dunks you in the water. Think of it. Just think as an adult. Would there be a God somewhere that is not going to be nice to you unless you get dipped in water? It's a ritual. But what's the ritual mean? Water means truth. The air means meditation. The earth is your mind. You take the earth, your mind, you put it in the water, which is the truth. When you come out of the water, which is the truth, you come up into the air, which is the third stage of consciousness, which is no thought. Then you can be touched by the fire, which is the spirit. Now you could go and get baptized. Because you are really baptized in here. You can never be baptized in real water. You are baptized in water, the second stage of the mind. That's where baptism takes place. So when you bring your mind into the truth, the teachings, you then rise above that truth in, out of the water, out of the truth into the third stage of consciousness, which is air, now you're in meditation, and you can be touched by the fourth stage, which is fire or spirit. Now you've been baptized. So now if we want to have a great ritual and go down and down to the creek and do it, you'll understand it. It's, it can be very nice. It can be very meaningful. Meaningful, Because you're acting something out in your body that you've already done and you understand in your spirit. That's where they made a big mistake. That's where Christianity makes a mistake. Christianity and Kabbalah put the emphasis on the ritual instead of what the ritual means. And it's all lost. There is nothing holy about getting in water. Absolutely nothing. And all of the other things that you've done in ritualistic things, you have to understand the spirit of it, see. And the failure of Kabbalah is to ignore the basic doctrine, which is also what Christ Christianity has totally, totally ignored the basic doctrine. Can you show me what the basic doctrine is? I'll show you what the basic doctrine is. Look. Uh, I'm not sure what page it is on. I think you can find it on page 853. Look at the book of Luke. You've seen this many times, but I want to show you the basic doctrine, okay, so that you know what you're supposed to do before you do baptism, before you do confirmations, before you do uh, communions, all of these different things. I want to show you what the basic, basic, basic doctrine is. Luke 17, 21, okay? Neither there nor there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, do you see that? Or we all here, right? Some of us here. Okay. I want you to look. I want you to look at that. Look at it again. You see what it says? The kingdom of God is within you. Now, what does Jesus Christ say is the basic doctrine so you can understand Kabbalah, you can understand yourself, you can understand the universe. Go to page, um, I'm not sure what page it's on. Go to Matthew. Keep your finger there. What does it say? The kingdom of God is within you, right? Go to Matthew. Go to chapter 6. Matthew 6. You there? Let me know when you're there. Okay? You got your finger still in Luke 17, 20, 21? All right. Go back to Luke 17, 20, 21, and look where it says what? Luke 17, 20. 21, the kingdom of God is within you. Do you see that? Now go back to Matthew 6, okay, verse 
33, what does it say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of those things that you're after shall be added unto you. That's the basic doctrine. The basic doctrine according to Jesus Christ is that God's kingdom is within you, and the first thing you must do before you go to church, before you read a Bible, before you get involved in any rituals, is seek within yourself to find that kingdom, and then all of these other things will be added unto you. Take it anywhere you want. Take it to any priest. Take it to any minister. Take it to any Christian. Take it to any Protestant, Catholic, whoever you want. Take it anywhere you want. You can't change the fact that in the Bible, Jesus Christ said the kingdom of God is within you and that he admonished you that before you do anything else, the first thing you must do is seek within yourself for that kingdom. And all of the other stuff would flow. All of the stuff you've been looking for, all of the stuff that your, that your rituals have never been able to be produced for you will be produced when you follow the instructions and enter within yourself and find that kingdom. There it's in the book. I mean, gee, for creepers. I mean, how can it be any clearer than that? And you saw it, and I would challenge you, take it to the bank, take it to any church you want, and nobody can change that. That's what the man said. I didn't see him in there where he said you got to be saved first. He told you what to do. Seek within yourself. That's where salvation comes from. But we have decided, no, we'll follow the traditions, we'll follow the religions, we'll follow the church, and we'll never understand because we're not doing it according to the one who had the authority to tell us how to do it, who was Jesus Christ. Look at this. Go to page 847. Book of Luke. Luke chapter 11. You want understanding? Luke chapter 11. You heard Jesus Christ say, my words have made you clean. I dare say 90%, if not 100% of you have gone to church all of your life. You never understood his words. You've never, you've never found them clean up the problems of your life. So the words didn't make you clean. Why? Why didn't the words make you clean? Why, before you came here, you didn't understand the Bible? Why is that? Why? You didn't know the things that you know now. Why? This is the answer. Luke 11. Chapter, verse 52, he's talking to the people who interpret the law. Woe unto you, lords. You have taken away the key of knowledge. How come? You entered not in yourselves. You didn't enter in yourself. What did he just get done telling you? He said, the kingdom is within you. Seek it. And now he's saying, you've, you, you've lost the key of knowledge because you haven't done what I said. You have not entered within yourself. And other people who are trying to enter in, you hindered. You blew the whole thing. You blew the whole thing. See, there were, in, in, the, in the Kabbalah, there were no hierarchies. All of the ritual is secondary to the basic truth. And that basic truth is when your will is surrendered to God and becomes one with His, what you do in ritual is acting out what has already been manifested as divine within you. What you will comes to pass. Ah, hear what I just said? What you will comes to pass. Why? Because it is not then what you will, it is what God wills. And when you reach that state of willful surrender, instructions come through the inner realms of the mind. See, the, the central teaching of all Kabbalah is this. Unity of all things. That's, that's, that's the central focal point of Kabbalah. Unity of all things. Listen, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Ehad. You know what it means? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is eternal, and the eternal is one. The eternal, it, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference if it's a Hindu shrine, a Muslim mosque, a Jewish temple, a Christian church, a forest glade. It doesn't make any difference if you call it Jesus, Jehovah, Brahman, Isis, Osiris, Muhammad. It doesn't make any difference. It's the same one. You, you could say, oh, well, they're not playing to Jesus. Well, they, it's just, it's just a different name. Same guy. Same God, just a different name. You're going to shoot people because it's a different name. There can't... 
A Muslim prays to God. He cannot be praying to a different God than you are because there's only one. How could he possibly be praying to a different God? There is no different God. There's only one. <laughs> He's just got a different name for it. What are you going to kill the guy because he calls it by a different name? You call Jesus by a different name. It's not even his name. Call him Jesus. His name is Jehoshua. Oh, that doesn't bother us. We changed his name. Then you give, the, you give all the disciples English names. You've got a bunch of Englishmen running around Israel. <laughs> Phil and Pete and John and uh, Andrew. Where do these guys come from? You put two Englishmen in the Garden of Eden, in the middle of the whole... You imagine this? Adam and Eve. What's this all about? From London. I don't think so. With no clothes on, you got them running around there. <laughs> oh, but yet. Oh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna is God. They call him Hare Krishna. Big deal. The same one. And we know it, can, it has to be God because it says right in the Bible there is only one. So if they pray to God, it's the same God. But we're going to shoot the guy because he gives him a different name. One. See, look, page 608 in your Bibles. A little bit late, but uh, we're doing pretty good here. Page 608 in the Bibles. Isaiah chapter 44. And this is the law of correspondence I talked to you about earlier. And this is what one of the things Kabbalah was right on with. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Watch it now. I am the first and the last, and besides me, there is no God. So what are you worrying about? <laughs> How can some guy be praying to the wrong God if there is only one God? Figure that one out. Oh, he's praying to the wrong God. There's only one. You see, the thing is, if he was praying to the wrong God, no problem, because he's not praying to anybody. Because there's only one God. Do you see what I'm telling you? Say to you? Here, this is God. You say, over here is God. That's the only God you can pray to. That's what the Christians say. You cannot pray to any other God but this God. Right? Well, this guy's praying to this God over here. But there is no one. <laughs> so what's the big deal? Why get upset about it? He's just praying to the air. This is not going to hurt anything. What's it going to hurt? See? If, now, if I said, oh, but there's a God over here, then we're, then we're saying we don't believe in the Bible because the Bible says there is no God over here. So the guy's just blowing wind. He's not hurting anybody. See? You can't pray to the wrong God because there is no wrong God. There's just one. And I doubt very much if the God up there is saying, oh, 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 he called me Hare Krishna. I'm not answering that. He's got to call me. Uh, what do we call God? We don't even have a name for him. Him, God. <laughs> At least they had a name, Hare Krishna. That's nice. It could sound like Harry. I remember, I'm just wild about Hare. And I, yeah, why not? That sounds good to me. His name is Harry, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Some guys called him. Uh, I deny. Some guy says, Zeus. Zeus. His name was Zeus. Say, so nobody prays to Zeus anymore. Well, if, if they still called him Zeus, he'd still be God. Wouldn't he? It wasn't God. It's just different names. Pete's sakes. Different names. I mean, how, how many people, when they, you know, really, when they first had, do you know when they first, the earth was created and everybody's running around the Middle East, there was nobody with the name of Mike? Kathy, you wouldn't, there was nobody in the world by the name of Kathy, nobody in the world by the name of Mike Rose, there was no such thing. We, we made all of these up. It's just like the Indians made up. Little Running Fox. What is this? Where is, I don't know anybody by that name, Little Running Fox. See, the names change, but that's all the same, just the same people. See, and so here then, unity of all things, there's only one God, says. That's the law of correspondence. It's all the same thing. Now, I want to show you something as we wrap this up. There is a part of the Kabbalah, which is the written part, which is called Zohar. Zohar. And according to the Zohar of the Kabbalah, it says, the written Torah, or the law, is clothed in garments which consist of worldly Stories. I'm going to repeat that because it's very important for you to know. I'm telling you what the Jews said about the Old Testament. The written word is cloaked in garments which consist of worldly stories. The uninitiated sees only this garment but fails to comprehend what is beneath the garment. 
See, the situation I've gone through with this blood pressure problem is very, very consistent with religion. I got to the point where even though I didn't feel that good, I thought that was normal. I didn't know that there was anything wrong underneath there. I thought that's the way everybody felt. That's the way you're supposed to be. But now I'm finding out, no, that's not the way. Because how come I've become aware? I've become enlightened. I understand that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's a different way. So you can feel better physically. But I didn't know that before because I was ignorant. In religion, it's the same thing. Every, oh, I'm religious. I'm holy. I I'm feeling in the Lord. No, you're not. You're feeling your emotions because the reason you, you think it is that's the way you think it's supposed to be because you don't know the way it's really supposed to be. You don't understand what's really supposed to come alive within you. And it is only when you can discern the soul of the Torah, the soul of the Word underneath, see, its outer garments, that you possess the secret of Kabbalah. When you understand that which is underneath. Now look quickly, page 812. You say, well, this is a long one. But yeah, a little bit, but I mean, uh, we haven't done it for a week. Mark chapter 4, 812, verse 11. And look what Jesus says about that very th same thing. Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. In other words, the mystery of the of your, What did Jesus say earlier in this lecture? The kingdom of God was in you. Unto you is given to know the mystery of that which is within you, the kingdom of God. But to them that are without, all these things are done in parables. In other words, to them that are without, what do they see? The outer garment. They don't see the body. Each of you has garments on. Underneath the garments is a body. Nobody can see that. Only you know that. It's personal. It's private. It's yours. It's sacred. It's holy to you. But you know it, and nobody else can see it. Unto you is given to know the mystery of your own body. But to everybody else, what do they see? Oh, they see a nice slacks, a nice colored shirt. They see a nice, you've got a blue, got a green shirt. That's you. It's not you. So you know that. But once you become aware there is a body, once you become aware there is a truth, once you become aware there is a life inside of these words that you can't see, what you're looking outside and seeing is the shirt and the slacks and the shoes and the sneakers when you read these words. But underneath the shirt and the shoes and the sneakers, there's a truth, there's a body, there's a life there. See, the Torah, which we, which we called before, is actually Genesis to Deuteronomy. That's the Torah. That's the law. That's what was written by Ezra and we've been talking about. See, in other words, can you understand about what it says? The written word is clothed in garment. Look, let me, let me make a proof. Let's make a proof here for you. You're going to have proof. Okay. This is what the Jews say. The written Torah, the Genesis to Deuteronomy, is clothed in garments which consist of worldly stories. The uninitiated sees only this outer garment, but fails to comprehend what is beneath. Do you understand that? Understand what I was just said? That's what the Jews say, that this is symbolic. Genesis to Deuteronomy is an outer garment. You have to look inside, and you have to take off and strip off the outer garment to see the body, to see the life that beats underneath of those words. Do you understand that? Okay, now let's see what the Bible says in the New Testament. Page 953. Galatians chapter 4. Here's the Apostle Paul talking about a famous story in that same Torah, the story of who? Abraham and Sarah. And what does he say? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 24. Which things are an allegory? <laughs> the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, those words are an outer garment. There's a mystery inside of the garment. There's a living body under those words. There's a truth under those words that you're not seeing because you're seeing the allegory. You're not seeing the truth. So here's the Apostle Paul, 100% in agreement with the Jews of the Kabbalah that this is a symbol and yet today, you'll find most Christians say, I believe every word of it, just as it's written, it's literal. They defy Paul, they defy the ancients who understood and wrote those, those documents. See, the ancient Kabbalah says that the divine language in the Old Testament is magical. 
And this is, let me, let me show you something else which they say. God did not give those words in correct order because people could then work miracles for their own purpose. Therefore, they were deliberately hidden in the Old Testament. And the, and the Zohar of the Kabbalah says that the written word is an outer garment of Shekinah. Let me get the word. S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H, which means glory. The, the written word is an outer garment. It is a covering over the Shekinah. See? But when you begin through meditation to understand, what you are doing is you're stripping off the outer garment and you are exposed to the throbbing heart of Shekinah, the body. And this is what Kabbalah says. The Zohar says, the written word is an outer garment of Shekinah glory, which she must wear because of man's fall. See? She must protect herself from the gaze of man because man will try to rape her. Man will try to penetrate her by force. So she wears the outer garment and she is covered and she is protected. And she will not intercourse except in the chamber of the upper room, as Jesus says, where then the production can be made of the incorruptible seed, the child Christ. So the garments of this Shekinah are black as a symbol of her mourning and as a symbol of her exile from her bridegroom. This is very beautiful. This is the story of Uranus and Gaia. She is separated from her husband. She is separated from the mind, and so she wears black. When she is reunited to the mind, when Isis, which is what this is, can be reunited to Ra, they can then have children. Huh? You with me? See what happened here? So she wears black. She is in mourning because her husband has been taken from her. That's why... That's why, the, that's why the church has made such a terrible mistake. God is a man. They don't know of her. They don't know of this mourning spirit inside who wears black because she has been taken from her husband. See? Father God stands alone. Mother God is in mourning. So when Mother God, Isis, Is, Ice, is restored to Father God, Ra, then they produce El, which is Israel, you. And it says, in, it says in Torah, through divine action within, we can strip her of her sober garments and adorn her with radiant garments, which are the mysteries of Kabbalah. That's the bride waiting for her bridegroom. Picture that sometime. As you think of it, huh? is your spirit wearing black? In mourning, if you have not meditated and followed the directions of Jesus Christ, you can take it to the bank that your spirit is draped in black. Mourning for her bridegroom. The bridegroom cometh as a thief in the night. But if you will allow her to go to the upper room where the bridegroom waits for the great consummation of the wedding, then you can adorn her with white and jewelry. Real quick. I know uh, you've been, I promise you this is the last scripture. Page 948. And this will sum it up for you as to what I've just talked about and what Kabbalah has just showed you. It's very interesting. She is you. See, Shekinah, your spirit is in mourning. It's in black because you have no husband. I'm talking male and female. Now, don't get into this thing of, under, see, you have no husband. Now what has happened? Page 948, 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 2. And this is Paul. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
So Shekinah should be taken out of her dark robes of mourning and placed in her white wedding gown, adorned with jewels, to mount the stairs to the upper where she is set. You know how sexual? Let me tell you something. You're all mature. I'll tell you something that'll... I thought I shocked you before, but I guess I didn't. So I'll tell you something that will shock you. You ready for this? Television and folks assembled? Do you know that the churches... See, in the Bible, the temple is you. The back of the temple faced the west. The front of the temple faced the east. So east is always here. Western. In the churches, they write, laid them out the same way. The head of the altar of the church was the, uh, the head. The body of was the sanctuary of the church. In fact, the sanctuary of the church is called the nave, of which you have a little dimple in the center of your abdomen called the navel. The center of the church is the nave. Now, ready for this one? The ancients worshipped the phallic symbol, which is the male sexual organ, in its erect position because it manifested the consummation and the production of. Do you know what the steeple in the church is? It's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. The head is the altar, the center is the nave, and the steeple is actually the worship continuing of the phallic symbol. It always was that way because that was the production of life. Did you ever wonder why they have steeples? Tell your friends. <laughs> Just tell them where you heard it. But you know something? Do you know something? It's true. It is absolutely true. And it's a historical fact. You have to come up or two. we have to get you on a... What, I'll repeat what you said. Go ahead. Does the church represent the female organs? I don't really know. I did read that in a book uh, some years ago. I'm dying. Well, it's very possible. That's probably why they had the organ upstairs. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No, no, I'm not laughing, but it may very well. I'm trying to tell you something as mature people. For God's sakes, what's wrong with that? You know? I mean, you have some people, oh, my God. Oh, it's, it's if you never, you didn't know what it was. You know? Oh, what does he mean? <laughs> So, uh, but that's a fact. It's a very interesting thing. I think it's extremely interesting. But th that was, in, in, in the most ancient times, that was a, that was a the, the male sexual organ in an erect position was a, was, a, was, a, was a great symbol of worship. And they call it phallic, P-H-A-L-L-I-C, phallic worship. And that's your, there's your church. So, we conclude with the understanding of the Shekinah, the understanding of the Spirit, the understanding that as Jesus said in John 14, 20, I am in my Father, you in me, I in you. So the magic, the power of God is available to everybody, but only to those who will listen and follow the law of the narrow way. We heard some stuff tonight that was pretty good, pretty heavy, very interesting and extremely, uh, you know, worthwhile of your perusing. You can, I, I tell you, though, it's very difficult. If you think you want to run down to the local bookstore and get a book on Kabbalah, it'll, it'll make your head spin. It'll absolutely make your head spin because, Al, you studied it for a while. It is extremely difficult. Just when you think you got it all figured out, it goes here and then goes over there and then it's here and what is this and then, because it's all jumbled. It's like uh, the Kabbalah is like a crossword puzzle. Everything is written to try to lead you away from the trail. So, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, how sometimes, did you ever see in the Bible these long genealogies and Nahor begat this and this guy begat that and this guy begat that? Something interesting. I, I'll show you sometime. I did it one on one. If you take some of those genealogies and take the names of who gave birth to who, write in the order in which they're given and see what the names mean, you'll get a message. There's a secret message contained in those names by what the names mean, lined up in order, and they'll spell out a message to you. This is what these people did. This is the way this is. doesn't mean anybody had begat anybody. It's, it's, it's written that way to, to give you a message. It's out for there. Thank you for sharing the time here about the Kabbalah and its magic. Uh, when you're finished with the tape, send it right on to the next person. 
send the card to Mary, back to Mary. There's a route sheet in the tape uh, that you receive. Put that route sheet in the box so the next person knows where to, where to send their tape. And then if you would, uh, J uh, Joan will uh, tell you in a little while about the needs that we have, okay, for continuing. This.